have to start by uh, slightly apologizing for my disheveled appearance today. Uh, I hope it doesn't reflect uh, not taking this seriously, but I began my journey here four weeks ago in Mozambique and uh, somewhere along the way, three continents and losing all my luggage. So, uh, and two hours ago, breaking out of my brother's flat, which he'd locked me in. So, <laughs> I'm here now. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, so, yeah, I'm Rob Power. At the moment, I've um, just won a, a Wellcome Trust Henry Wellcome Fellowship. I'm based at the uh, Wellcome Trust Africa Centre, which is part of University College London, but actually in South Africa. And in April, I'll be moving to the Big Data Institute in, in Oxford. And I just want to outline, as, as Peter mentioned, I, I did my PhD here, um, the one plus three, and, and finished it uh, about two years ago now. And it was with Catherine Lewis uh, and Peter. And that was actually, uh, I managed to meet Irv on, on uh, one or two occasions during that. But the main contact I had with him was really by, by email. He, he several times when I had papers published, he, he sent uh, a nice email saying, how nice I wasn't asking follow-up questions. I was very honored to, to have his interest. Actually, I was very honored, and I went out and tried to boast about it to everyone at the lunch uh, table, but it turned out he'd actually emailed most of those people as well. <laughs> um, so he really took a, a huge interest in, in the research coming out of the center, and I think from young scientists everywhere. So that was, that was my real interaction with him. And just uh, what I'm going to be talking about um, today is, is what my PhD was on. It was on kind of the selection and evolution of psychiatric disorders, uh, how genes and environment interact, and, and also how we kind of define the diagnoses of, of these psychiatric disorders, especially when they're blurry. But really, I, I think what the, the focus is is how we can use genetics to tease apart all these uh, questions. And before I go into those, I'm just going to give a brief example of each one of those. Um, I now have moved into infectious disease research, so a bit of a traitor to the department in, in that respect. But uh, if anyone's interested in what I'm doing, I'm afraid I won't be talking about it today. Um, but there's a review coming out in, in Nature Gen uh, Genetics Reviews. Um, which should highlight that if anyone's interested. So the first, um, first example I wanted to talk about was a paper I had on, on natural selection and psychiatric disorders, and so really about how these genes for the different disorders interact. And, and this is also a question on how the same genes, which I, I guess was what Peter was talking about in the Hong Kong case, how these, the same genes for psychiatric disorders actually affect people um, who, who don't have the disease. Uh, and so are they putting people at huge risk, are they putting them at, at kind of prodromal symptoms, or is there any kind of change? And some of you might know this paper from Huxley about the schizophrenia paradox and how, uh, how does schizophrenia stay in the population, since it really, you can see in the next slide, really these psychiatric disorders, they reduce uh, people's uh, ability to, well, they, people have much fewer children, particularly autism and, and anorexia and schizophrenia, when they have these disorders, uh, particularly in the severe cases, but these diseases are also quite common and highly heritable. Um, and particularly the fact that they have a, this is due to the, having a very early age of onset. So they, they have a high mortality, they have a high impact on people's lives, and they occur very early on before people have children. So the question was kind of how do these genes really stay in the population? Uh, so this was kind of the first thing that I got interested in. Um, and I have to say, yes, uh, uh, this was one where I came to Peter with a, a buzzing idea of how we might do it. I won't be showing this results, but it was a, a collaboration in Sweden, and they thankfully actually pushed me to go do it rather than uh, stop me from disappearing off across the world uh, uh, to follow up these ideas. So really, thanks to the mentorship as well. Um, but so, so my idea was, this was another exchange actually, was could these genes for psychiatric disorders or these genetic variants have benefits that we don't know about? Um, and what I was really interested in, oh, well, actually, first I need to give you a short introduction to statistical genetics. Hopefully, some of you this will be very familiar, and to others this won't be too painful. Um, good to know that you were doing all the proofreading for the, the <laughs> works, and maybe some of this will make sense. But for those of you, one idea that's key is, is the genome-wide association study at GWAS. Really, it, it's looking at whether a variant is more common in cases or controls. Uh, so you have a genetic variant, and you're interested. If it's more common in the cases, then it might be a causal mutation for the, that disease that you're interested in. And you have these simple C's, T's, A's, and, and G's, and you're looking to see if one is more common than the other. And really, the, 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 the trick to this is they don't do it once, you do it hundreds of thousands, millions of times. And what you end up with is a, a results table uh, like this, where you have variants all across the genome and their kind of significance. And anything that passes the, the bar for, for uh, that red line there for being considered significant, is, is potentially a gene that's, that's causal for that disease, or a variant that's causal for that disease. Uh, and that you can see, so anything that passes that line uh, there. But what I, what, I, what I will be talking about really is, is a tool that's slightly different, and it doesn't look at these individual variants, but as a way of, of really pooling 
all these effects together in the hopes that you can get a kind of one predictor, a kind of genetic score um, uh, that, that you can use then to kind of understand the disease a bit better. So instead of having to look at each variant individually where there might be a small effect, you can kind of sum them all into one big score. So you do a, a one GWAS in one sample, and then you take the results of that, and in a second sample you can construct scores and give each individual a kind of genetic risk score for that disease. And then you can see what that genetic risk score predicts and better understand maybe what's going on in terms of the genes for, or the genetic variants for a given disease. And so you're interested in kind of how much of the variants can be explained in, in, in the second samples. You're taking the results of the first. So to anyone who's not an expert, really you're just ending up with a score that is a kind of predisposition to that disease genetically and how much that has an effect on other factors. And so what you can see here, just for those who are more interested, is that you can do this in several different ways. You can construct scores on the left-hand side that have only very few, um, still maybe a thousand uh, uh, variants, or you can do it with tens of thousands or, or hundreds of thousands of variants. And as you add more and more um, uh, variants, you, you explain more and more of the variation up until a certain point. Um, so what was I interested in, in terms of bringing this back to psychiatric disorders and what the benefits could be? Well, really, one thing I thought would be interesting would be creativity. Um, and there's a lot of anecdotal evidence about famous artists who, who also have psychiatric problems, but also studies from epidemiology where we've shown, or it has been shown, that people with mental illness are more likely to become certain types of artists or artistic uh, professions. And so what I thought, could we actually use these scores to see, do people with, um, uh, with who, are, who are artists or in some sort of creative profession actually have a higher burden for these uh, genetic risk factors for, for different psychiatric disorders. And thankfully I was able to do this because we had an ongoing collaboration with, uh, with DECO Genetics, an exchange scheme uh, for understanding uh, schizophrenia. And DECO Genetics is a, a private company in Iceland and uh, set up with the idea, I don't know if they sell it quite like this, but I think the idea was that you have a very small isolated community of people who are quite uh, inbred and uh, you know who everyone's related to, and you can track it down, and, and, and really they've de developed a, a lot of information on, on uh, containing, getting, or collecting rather, all the information on the medical records and the genetics of these people. So actually, I think, I say here 100,000, that's what we had at the time. The population of Iceland is about 300 and 400,000, and about 100,000 of, of those individuals uh, have genetic information on them. But actually, I think now it's probably up to 150 or 200,000 um, and they have access to all the health records. And what I was interested in was they also have a lot of public records about what societies you're part of, what, uh, whether you're part of the, the national orchestra or things like that. So you can use that information in, in other ways. Um, and so, as I said, we got about 100,000 people and they had about 600 uh, or 500 schizophrenia patients and, and 680 bipolar patients. But what they also had access to were about 1,300 creative uh, uh, professions um, that, that we kind of listed. We also included chess players, so we were mildly curious to see uh, about that and based on some anecdotes. And what we were able to do was really see if those people had uh, increased burden of, of schizophrenia risk alleles. And, and first we looked in the, the patients, and we, uh, so yeah, do, do these creative individuals have a higher polygenic risk for these psychiatric disorders? We were able to do that and say, the schizophrenia patients have more risk, so the higher the bar is, the more, uh, uh, the better it's explaining. So for the layman's terms, you can imagine that the higher the bar, the more of a burden these, these people have um, for the, the risk genes. And so schizophrenia genes here predicted schizophrenia, bipolar predicted bipolar, which was as we expected. But what we also found was that to a much lower degree, but still significantly, schizophrenia, uh, it's a person, person's genetic predisposition to schizophrenia predicted whether they were a uh, creative individual or, uh, and same for bipolar disorder. So we could show that there was some sort of genetic overlap uh, between these, these traits in the general population. So that's one example of how we can kind of understand how, uh, how these genes affect healthy individuals. And then I want to talk about how, in another way, they, they affect healthy individuals in terms of how they choose their environment. Um, and so gene environment correlation is the term that, that we use, but there's many ways of talking about it. But really, this is how do people choose out and seek out and create their environment based on their own genetic predispositions. And so maybe how a small genetic difference could actually escalate into changing environments and, and a bigger effect down the road. And for this, I thought a topical uh, issue would be cannabis and, and schizophrenia. And this is a, a meta-analysis where showing that about uh, people who, who regularly smoke cannabis are about two times the risk of, of getting uh, schizophrenia in their lives. 
And most of the time people think about this in terms of cannabis affecting uh, schizophrenia risk. But I was curious to see if maybe it was the other way around as well. Maybe were people who are more likely to develop schizophrenia also more likely to use uh, cannabis. And uh, this, this, so that's exactly what we tested. Does this genetic predisposition to schizophrenia uh, increase cannabis use? And in a sample, okay, there we go. Um, so in a sample, we looked at uh, whether twins uh, who never use, so we had twins here, two pairs uh, of individuals, and um, so we had uh, individuals where both twins didn't use cannabis, where one did, and where uh, both twins used cannabis. And these were identical twins, so they, they were genetically the same. And I've given the results away a bit here, but that's exactly what we uh, found, was that the people who were less using cannabis actually had a lower risk, genetic risk of, of schizophrenia, and uh, the, more, the higher your genetic risk of schizophrenia, the more likely you were to use cannabis. And these were people who were unaffected with any psychiatric or severe psychiatric trait. Um, and we found this was true both for using cannabis and also for quantity of use if you were a user. So it didn't seem to be just initiation, but also the kind of severity, or well, not necessarily severity, but the, the scale of, of use. And so we were kind of curious then to see if this was, um, uh, whether this was just cannabis or, or whether it was all addiction. And, that, and that's actually what we went back to decode and, and found that, um, that actually what was happening was that people who were predisposed to schizophrenia were more likely to use uh, almost any uh, drug, um, including alcohol and I think tobacco as well, actually, uh, not on here. So this was, uh, I thought, an interesting finding on how we kind of shape our environments, and it actually got a lot of traction in, in the media. And what I thought was funny was uh, on Facebook I saw that it was being advertised, and I thought this was something that maybe people would find interesting because it meant that uh, maybe the risks of smoking cannabis were overblown, but then I realized most people didn't actually read the article, uh, so they actually just read the title. I don't even think they read the title. I think they read just schizophrenia and, and uh, cannabis. And my favorite comment underneath said, I don't know who this Dr. Rob Power is, but he clearly works for Big Pharma and is trying to uh, kind of win people over to the idea that cannabis is bad. And I, I was thinking, this is actually the other way around, maybe. But, um, so it seems like a topical issue, but maybe people don't actually read the articles uh, on it or the titles even. Um, so then I, I'll just go on to the last, last topic that I wanted to, uh, uh, to, to talk about, which was how we can use these to understand the kind of background or the, to understand the diagnoses of, of disease. Um, and so this was something we're looking at uh, at major depression. Uh, was a, a big GWAS that was done of that, and they, they didn't really find that this is a bit of a dated slide, actually, now. I think they've done much, much more successful uh, in the, the recent studies. But um, really, at the time, they hadn't found anything for, for, uh, for depression in terms of the specific genetic variants. Um, and there was a lot of issues about how that could be possible because they had a huge sample, and I think at the time it was the biggest GWAS to find absolutely nothing. Um, and so people were getting a bit worried. And one of the things that people were thinking about was the fact that you have this huge diversity in, in people who are coming to the clinic with depression. And you have these nine core symptoms uh, that people can, can uh, present with. And actually this can lead to about uh, just under 1,500 combinations of, of symptoms that you can have, particularly because some of these symptoms can manifest as in people have, uh, say, uh, sleeping too much, um, or people can actually be sleeping not enough. And so then you can actually have people who have almost opposite symptoms being lumped into the same clinical category. So we were interested to see if we could use something simple to break down this, uh, uh, break down this, this complexity in, in the clinical trait. And what we thought we might use was age at onset. Uh, there's some work suggesting that there were different heritabilities and, and, and that kind of thing in, in by many of the people here um, to suggest that uh, the age of onset might be a factor. And so what we, again, use these polygenic risk scores to think, okay, well, we know that some diseases overlap with, with, uh, with depression in, in the general population, and they overlap at different ages, Alzheimer's, heart disease, obviously, in later life, schizophrenia and bipolar in, in earlier life. So we created these polygenic risk scores for these diseases and tried to see, is there any difference in, in, in those people who have early onset depression and those who have late onset depression? And what we found was that for, for Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's predicted depression, but it didn't, you can see at the very end there, it didn't really predict anything different based on whether you got depression early 
uh, late in life. So there was an overlap, but it seemed to be a more general overlap. Uh, same for heart disease. Uh, people, depression and heart disease seem to genetically overlap to a smaller degree, but it didn't seem to matter when you got depression in your life, when that overlap was. But for schizophrenia and for bipolar, what we found was that while there is an overlap between those diseases, it's much stronger if those people have an early onset of depression. So it seems to be this early onset depression is much more tied to, to these uh, bipolar and, and schizophrenia um, genetics. And so what we then were able to do was to kind of look to see if any SNPs individual genetic markers were more, had a larger effect in, depending on your age at onset. And what we found were, so this is one example, or the main example, that the, there were specific genetic markers that increased your risk of depression, but only in later life, it seems. So early onset was associated more with genetically with, with psychosis and, and schizophrenia and, and bipolar, but the later onset depression seemed to have these specific depression-only uh, variants that, that caused it. So I think that's my brief, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, but that's my brief run-through of, of, um, of what we can use these statistical genetic tools really to to really better understand the diagnostics of, of psychiatry, of really also to understand how mental illness relates to normal human, or normal, depending on what, how you consider somehow eccentric some of those artists might have been or might not have been in Iceland, but uh, normal behavior and also how genes and environment interact and how you have a kind of creation of your, your predispositions at birth can lead to then follow on uh, uh, creation of uh, your own specific environment and interact with your environment. And I, I really wanted to highlight these because these were, were all projects that were done with different groups um, uh, across the world, really. And, and I think this was, you know, I, I had a very, what I wanted to highlight was I had a very varied PhD, and that was really only possible because of the, the kind of enthusiasm in the SGDP to, to work with other people, to really get involved in, in other areas um, and, and collaborate with people. And I think from, from what I've heard from, from Peter and the like, author, uh, that really seemed to be something that he came from uh, Peter's mentorship with, with uh, and uh, I think it's a, uh, yeah, a wonderful aspect of the, the SGTP that we're able to get the enthusiasm and get the support to, to do that kind of thing here. Um, so I, I just wanted to say I was uh, really only able to do all these fun projects and travel to different parts of the world, though I have to say I enjoyed Australia in the summer more than I enjoyed Iceland in the middle of winter. Um, but uh, able to do these projects with the support of, of the SGDP and, and really enjoyed it. And, and a lot of people that I have to thank here in, in the SGDP, there's only a fraction of, of the people and, and outside. Uh, so thank you for listening.